I'm the head of uh, new business development and my role is uh, really looking at uh, sourcing uh, or technology, technology scouting in Australia um, and trying to fit that into our global R&D effort. Um, my presentation this morning will attempt to give a, a slightly different view, which is the view really coming from the other side, uh, you know, painting a picture of the global innovation environment and, and pose the question as to whether you know, uh, Australian ag uh, um, investment is it a, an opportunity or, or a challenge for us. I'll offer some personal uh, suggestions on uh, that uh, may benefit uh, us all working in this field. That's sort of a map of what I'm going to do. I think I'll just get into it. So uh, just a brief introduction um, to Bayer. So um, Bayer is a, a life science innovation company. Uh, we're 150 years old, uh, a couple of years ago actually, and we have core competencies in healthcare and agriculture. Uh, we believe our products are really helping to contribute to face some of the critical challenges we're all facing, which is a growing and ageing world population which require certainly improved medical care and an adequate supply of food. I think we're all aware of the challenge of uh, food production going forward. We're very much innovation based. Our, our uh, mission statement uh, it reads as science for a better life. Just a few figures uh, to give you some dimensions. I mean, uh, yeah, you may, we're based in northwestern uh, uh, Germany, uh, and it's, uh, it's a pretty big company. It's actually the biggest uh, German company by market cap uh, now. Um, uh, we are investing around about 3.5 billion euros in R&D per year, 104,000 employees, 302 subsidiaries around the world, and, and 41 billion uh, euros of turnover, so not a small beast. Um, agriculture, uh, broadly, is 25% of that. You can just draw a line right, right down through the middle, you know, and uh, the, the, all the figures divided by four is roughly what, what uh, we're doing in agriculture. And just for reference, uh, Australia, we do about a uh, billion uh, dollars of turnover, so we're around about 0.7% of the world, of the whole, um, the whole uh, company. So, uh, yeah. So if we look at uh, crop science, uh, we have three business units. The, the core of our activities is still uh, crop protection, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, etc. Uh, we have been building up our seeds division, vegetable seeds, and in particular in cotton, canola, rice, wheat, and, and soybeans, and the associated traits. And we have environmental products, which are the products you use in the home, around the home, in golf co courses, uh, forestry, uh, and, and so on. So after 89 years of operation in Australia, Bayer Crop Science is one of the, the leading crop science companies uh, in, in Australia. Our 250 staff are committed to our local mission, which we uh, uh, state as advancing Australian agriculture. We have the largest in-house development team uh, in the industry, which tests completely all of our products for their performance and safety. We are one of only two uh, international companies that have uh, our own dedicated production facilities in Australia, and we have two factories producing around about 200 products. Uh, in 2014, we opened uh, a $14 million wheat and all seed breeding station uh, on the Long Renon campus in Horsham. And finally, we have extensive uh, sustainability programs, including five separate ag education programs. We sought several support several rural, mental and uh, physical health initiatives. Uh, and we're a core member of the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative of Australia, along with a lot of large uh, food companies. Uh, so I think overall these investments, long-term investments, uh, you know, emphasise that we have a long-term commitment to Australian agriculture. So I don't want to uh, make it a, a product presentation, but I, I just thought I'd highlight some of our recent uh, product uh, launches, which sort of indicate the diversity of technologies that we're, we've been recently introducing. So in fact, over the last five years, we've introduced 22 new products, four of which are based on new active ingredients. I'll highlight on the top left-hand side, Sakura, which is a new herbicide controlling resistant ryegrass, uh, which is a key resistant weed management tool in the Australian wheat, wheat production systems, and I think it's probably the biggest product sold in Australia uh, at the moment. Uh, BELT is a new selective insecticide that allows uh, pest control programs uh, in incorporating biological products. And these programs are, these programs are actually recognised with two national awards over the last uh, couple of years for the innovative way in which we put a whole consortium of different companies and products together. 
Podguard uh, canola uh, is a new uh, variety launched last year which reduces the natural process of pod shatter in canola. So direct heading of canola is possible which reduces the seed and yield losses. And finally, Lunar Sensation is a new generation fungicide which can extend the shelf life of different fruit uh, through exceptional in-crop disease control. So such innovations help Australian farmers keep at the cutting edge of uh, low impact, sustainable and globally competitive farming systems. I'll talk a little bit now about uh, in the innovation pipeline sort of going forward. I mean, th those products are sort of classically in where you might expect us to be uh, developing products, but there's a lot of activity um, uh, more broadly looking forward. So our historical strength has, uh, and I'll just comment that this is a sort of general trend, we're doing it, but certainly some of the other companies are uh, doing it as well. Bayer's historical strength has been in chemistry as, and as product, production and biological systems uh, evolve, there's a continual need for better, more targeted and safer chemistry. And we've kept a lot of activity in that space. Since 1990, there's been a strong focus on seeds and traits, along with uh, um, many companies. Trait targets have now moved from uh, herbicide insecticide resistance to yield optimization, photosynthetic efficiency and, and drought tolerance. Oh, sorry, that should have been there. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, the last 10 years have seen, uh, you know, almost an explosion of different types of tools um, uh, that have really opened up possibilities uh, in, in different areas. So molecular breeding, computational biology, diagnostic tools, proteomics, epigenetics, that next one I can never say, and uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic biology. Um, you know, we, we are getting a picture of, of biology in a way that we never really had uh, in the past, and that is, is opening really new areas of, of research. I'll, I'll point at uh, the second one first, bi biologics. We, we are now one of the leading companies in biological pest control. And again, you know, our understanding of how these, uh, these biological agents work is much better than it ever was, so we can actually start to use those to have really effective pest control. Crop efficiency is directly impacting the stress factors that are, that are occurring in crop. Of course, digital agriculture, new breeding technologies. We've, we've all heard about uh, CRISPR and, and various other new breeding, very precise breeding technologies that, uh, you know, where there's a lot of effort going into. And finally, sustainability research, which really emphasises that we're really doing a lot of activity and research about the actual long, long or end-to-end -end sustainability impact of these technologies and integrating them in, uh, in integrated systems that uh, ensure the, the, um, the long-term sustainability of those systems. With the broadening of these R&D fields, global R&D companies have rapidly incre increased their R&D spending. So this uh, re recent report indicates that the top six companies, which actually in a few days will be the top five companies and possibly the top four, uh, are now in, in investing in excess of eight billion US dollars uh, per year in, in, uh, in R&D in these spaces. So it's a very substantial amount of, uh, um, of money. You know, you may wonder how you can get to spend so much money. So I thought I'd just show you a couple of pictures, just looking at the chemistry uh, research. And this is uh, our headquarters uh, in Monheim in northeastern Germany. Um, around 2,000 people work at this site, and they, and uh, but the process across the whole site, but the process actually starts at a very unimpressive building, uh, which we, which is really a glorified shed, which we call our sample logistics facility. So that, that building is actually a robotic building which stores 1.5 million uh, vials uh, small, of, of chemicals, which is the accumulated history of more than 100, research, 100 years of research at Bayer Crop Science. About 50,000 bottles are added each year and, and the bottles are sampled continuously. The five robots each travel 5,000 kilometres per year, continuously sorting uh, in what is called a lovely German-English uh, translation of double chaotic system. So. <laughs> The bottles I often say is, are you talking about the building or the company as a whole? But you know, they don't seem to get that joke. Um, the, the bottles are randomly sorted into trays and the trays are randomly sorted into the building to continually minimise the space that's required. So the, the building is worth $110 million and the contents is worth well over a billion, a billion dollars. So the capital investment, and that's just the start of the process. I mean, you know, as you, you know, we, we screen about 100,000 molecules a year. So as you go through, it, it's replicated all, all around the world. So there's massive, you know, capital investment required to develop these uh, these products, and it's done over a long time frame. You may have seen this sort of um, uh, graph. It's roughly 10 years of, of extensive trials all around the world to bring uh, one of these products uh, 
uh, to market and, and the costs uh, are consequently huge. <laughs> You know, um, this external study done seven years ago uh, showed that the cost was $250 million per product. I believe we basically think about $500 million per product now to bring one active ingredient to market. And I, I want to make, stop here and make a, a, a point about uh, genetic, genetic traits, uh, about what they would cost. Superficially, they, they should be relatively cheap. But when we consider all of the money that be, that's been sunk in GM crops over the last 20 years, and the fact that there probably are only five or seven or eight events that have actually been uh, deregulated all around the world, the cost is probably the same, the same or higher per, per genetic event. So you get something like $500 million, uh, by, for, by reference, uh, in, in pharmaceuticals they always talk about a billion dollars for, for a, new, a new drug. So the costs are, are very, very high. So an increasingly strong feature about these global R&D efforts is that the, the IP is increasingly broadly held. Uh, which necessitates international collaboration. Leading Australian scientists can legitimately be part of these collaborations and can help shape the direction of the research and increase the chance that the outcomes uh, are more directly applicable to Australia. Australia, however, faces some real challenges in, uh, uh, in, in, in these collaborations and I, I just want to, we should be very clear-eyed about what they are. The first one, of course, is dollars. Uh, you know, transformational R&D requires real money, as you've seen. And we, we, we have a limited amount of it. But having said that, I think, the, the, particularly through the RDC system, which really funnels the money through a, 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 number, a, a, small, a smaller number of doors, uh, it can be effectively allocated and it's still very attractive to international players. The second is uh, the um, uh, challenge of distance, kilometres, time, market size, culture. This sign at Kuyong, I saw at Kuyong, I think it's fantastic. It just indicates that we're 16,000 kilometres from everywhere. Uh, we're, we're a small distant player. We are 0.3% of the global uh, population. We do well. We feed 0.9% of the world population uh, on, you know, on a good day. Um, uh, and we invest a, a few percent of, of uh, the R&D. It basically means that global major companies are not developing technology directly for, for Australia. So we really have to figure out how we can engage with them to, to get their, their interest. Having said that, it can be done, and I'll give you some examples of, of, of how it has been done. I think the biggest challenge, though, however, I've invented a new word called discollaboration. We are demonstrably not very good at setting up these and managing these types of collaborations. This problem really started, came to light uh, in 2014 with the, uh, the, uh, the publication of the OECD STI sur survey, which is Science, Technology and Innovation which indicated that Australian companies were third last in the, in the OECD in terms of international collaborations. However, we led the world in a negative sense uh, when it came to uh, business and collaboration between business and, and academia, where we were stone dead last uh, behind Mexico and, and, and Chile. This has impacts and uh, we saw that, uh, that uh, it was picked up by Larry Marshall in the, the CSIRO strategy and then also picked up by the Prime Minister pointing out that we are ranked 10th in the world in terms of innovation input. We are 81st in the world, which would be well behind, behind many third world countries in terms of our innovation efficiency. That is, bringing products to market from the dollars that we spend in R&D. And it even got uh, coverage in The Economist on January the 9th, which uh, pointed out that uh, uh, there are a few innovation-based startups in Australia and only 1 to 2 percent of companies can be described as innovating. I thought that was pretty harsh. Uh, however, we, you know, for whatever it is, whatever the reason, we are starting to build a reputation and not for the good reasons, not for good reasons. Whatever the background, we as a country uh, and individuals need actively to, to, to take these challenges on and do, do better, seek, seek how we can solve them. Probably best to forget you know, the reasons for this and really look at what are our strengths that we can leverage uh, going forward. So, what are these opportunities? And this is just my, my opinions. I think uh, we, we should start from the fact that we have great R&D here. There's absolutely no doubt. We have apparently nine of the top 100 global life sciences universities conducting world-class research. CSIRO is undeniably a world leader and, and a world leading brand um, as well. The Australian environment creates some specific set of outcomes which are of interest globally. We have established skills, skills in low input dry land agriculture, which will become increasingly relevant uh, under a climate changing world. 
Secondly, we have a focus on efficient agriculture, driven by a complete lack of uh, government subsidies. There is an upside. Uh, we, uh, you know, we are very efficient in, in, in what we do, and uh, you know, when we do something, it, is really, um, uh, it really produces result on the ground. And uh, not to support Selwyn too much, but point out that the PERD Act and the, RD, the RDCs are really a great, uh, you know, a, a great innovation. Um, you know, in, in an organisational sense, it, it provides a one-door entrance point for companies such as Bayer, which really cannot be under underestimated. You can go there, you can get a, a, a picture of, of all of the R&D activities in the country, and there is the opportunity uh, for some potential co-funding. Co so to give you hope, I, I want to give you some examples of what we've done at Bayer. Through you know, intensive engagement uh, from, our, from our side and tremendous uh, support from the institutes and the RDCs involved, We've managed to attract some strong focus from our global R&D uh, organisation over, over the preceding years. We'll start with the example of CSIRO. We've collaborated with CSIRO for some 20 years in cotton and wheat breeding research, as well as fundamental science research, such as the invention or the demonstration of gene silencing in plants uh, in the, the middle of the last decade. Bayer has marketed CSIRO cotton uh, varieties in the US and around the world since uh, 1997, which has returned royalties to underpin further Australian research. This and other collaborations were key in convincing our company to invest the $14 million necessary at Long Renong, uh, which, which is uh, supporting the revitalisation of that historic agricultural campus, but more importantly of all, you know, turning the, the research into reality for farmers, you know, creating the varieties that they can use on, on their farms. And I'll point out that we, we cooperated with those various organisations on the bottom right hand side uh, in, in that partnership. Most recently, um, uh, we announced uh, the Bayer GRDC Herbicide Innovation Partnership last year, which, which saw the signing of a $45 million herbicide, a global herbicide innovation partnership, which will see Australia raised to the top tier, uh, a top tier country in herbicide focus for, for Bayer, including local testing of early candidates in, in Germany, uh, the, the subsequent testing of all of these candidates in Australia much earlier than, than has been done in the past, and the training of 30 Australian postdoctoral fellow, fellows in advanced herbicide research. And you see two happy people uh, from Curtin University uh, who are uh, over there now. They started on the 1st of December last year. We're opening, it next, opening that laboratory next Wednesday. It's a unique collaboration which you know, places Australia at the cutting edge of, uh, of that activity of herbicide research. So uh, just to finalise, um, so is it a challenge or an opportunity? Well, I think it's a challenging opportunity. Um, transformative ag innovation is a global activity. You know, Australia needs to as uh, access global technologies to meet local, local challenges. R&D collaboration is critical, cross-country, cross-institution, cross-company. Australia has unique opportunities uh, based on our special skills and, and, uh, and environment. The PERD and, and the ARC systems are, are real assets. Uh, Australia, however, faces some key challenges which shouldn't be underestimated. The distance, the dollars, uh, the discollaboration. We must develop a global innovation mindset, defend and grow our core structures, universities, CSIRO and the PERD, the PERD institutions. Um, it's absolutely critical that uh, we, in, in, at least in certain areas, we, we remain world leading and then we can attract the interest of global companies. We need to build a global, uh, a long term skills in global co collaboration. You know, it's not for the faint hearted dealing with the big companies, I, I admit that, but you know, it's something that has to be done and uh, we need to build those skills. Uh, and where we are a global leader, we really should take up the cudgel, we should lead, you know, at a global level. So I'd like to finish with my slide of the Global Youth Ag Summit held in Australia last year, another type of uh, broad-based broad collaboration, and you can see the various uh, institutes we, we collaborated with there. We had 100 young people from around the world, and they uh, uh, discussed the issue of uh, global food security. Uh, we uh, developed, or they developed, a, a Global Youth Ag Declaration, which we took to the FAO, and it resulted in uh, 300 international news articles and more than 24 million social hits, social media hits. Uh, as far as we can see, all of them were positive. So it's an example of what we, I think we all need to do. Uh, we need to actively promote our country to the world. If we don't uh, do it, no one else will. Thank you very much.